Chiastic structures are arguably one of the most fascinating and helpful things you can discover in the Bible. But actually finding them is not always easy, especially if you don't know where to look. That's why in this video, I want to share with you six of the most common types of chiastic structures in the Bible you should definitely be aware of when you study this book. Now, before we get into the different types, let's just briefly review what a chiastic structure is. So, a very basic definition would be that it's a literary technique in which a certain sequence or series of words, phrases, or themes in a text is repeated in reverse order, often around a central element that is not repeated, which the author or speaker wants to highlight in a special way. So, really, this structure is a way of communication. It's a way of letting the reader know what's important and what the author is trying to get across, which means it's very helpful to take note of chiastic structures when you're studying the Bible. Now, the cool thing about chiastic structures is not just that you can find them everywhere in the Bible, but also that they occur on all textual levels. And in this video, I want to show you some examples of that so you know where to look for them when you study the Bible. Ready? Let's go. So, the first kind of chiastic structure you should be aware of is also the shortest and most basic kind you can find in the Bible and is one that comprises just a single statement or a single verse. For example, in Matthew 23, 12, Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So here we have a sequence of two elements, exalted and humbled, in the first part of the statement that is repeated in reverse order in the second part of the statement, humbled and exalted. Or take Matthew 6, 24, where Jesus is talking about wealth, and he makes that well-known statement no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Once again, we've got a sequence of elements that's repeated in reverse order, and what this example also shows is that the author doesn't always repeat the exact same thing in the second sequence, but sometimes uses synonyms or similar ideas, because in the first sequence, he says hate and love, but in the second sequence, he says be devoted to and despise. So when you're looking for a chiastic structure, don't just look for exact repetition of words or phrases, but also for similar words or concepts. A second place where you want to look for chiastic structures is in paragraphs or scenes. And a good example of that is found in 1 Samuel 24, which is the story of David cutting off part of Saul's robe in the cave. Now, the part we're going to focus on specifically are verses 3 to 7, which is where the actual scene in the cave is described. And if you look closely, you'll notice that it begins with Saul entering the cave in verse 3, and it ends with him leaving the cave in verse 7. Then we have two statements about David and his men in the second part of verse 3, and at the beginning of verse 7. And then in verse 4, David's men are speaking to him, and in verse 6, David is speaking to them. Which means that at the center of the paragraph is David's act of cutting Saul's robe and his reaction. And this central part also has a chiastic arrangement, because David's cutting of the robe is mentioned both at the end of verse 4 as well as at the end of verse 5, so that at the very heart of the scene is the statement about David's reaction in verse 5, where it says that afterward his heart struck him. So by arranging the text in this way, the author really wants to focus our attention not just on the act itself, but even more so on the reaction of David. This is the thing that he's really trying to highlight, but we're only going to see that if we recognize the chiastic arrangement of the scene. Another good place to look for chiastic structures is stories, simply because a lot of them are arranged like that. Like, for example, the story of the healing of a man with an unclean spirit in Mark 1, 21 to 28. If you look at verse 21, you'll see that the story begins with them going into Capernaum and Jesus entering the synagogue, and it ends in verse 28 with the news about Jesus spreading, or as it literally says, going out everywhere into all the surrounding districts. So there's going in at the beginning, and then going out at the end. Then in both verse 22 and verse 27, we have the reaction of the people to the teaching and authority of Jesus. Then in verses 23 to 24, there's a man with an unclean spirit who cries out and challenges Jesus. And in verse 26, the unclean spirit is crying out again and leaving the man. So at the very center of this story is Jesus' statement in verse 25 that demonstrates his authority over the unclean spirit and marks the turning point of the narrative. Okay, so that was an example of a story that's arranged chiastically, but in the Bible, we don't just have individual stories, but also so-called cycles, which is several stories that are grouped together to form a larger unit. Like, for example, the stories of Abraham in the book of Genesis. 
or the stories of Elijah and Elisha in the book of Kings. And the cool thing is that these cycles can also be arranged as chiasm. If you go to the book of Daniel, for example, and you analyze Daniel 2 to 7, you'll notice that there's a prophecy about four Gentile kingdoms in chapter 2, and there's another prophecy about four Gentile kingdoms in chapter 7. Then in Daniel 3, we have Daniel's three companions who are thrown into the fiery furnace, but are saved by God from certain death. And in Daniel 6, we have Daniel, who is thrown into the lion's den and is also saved by God, which leaves us with chapters 4 and 5, where in both cases, we have a Babylonian king who exalts himself and is judged by God. And in both chapters, Daniel functions as an interpreter. So once you look closely, it's pretty clear that the author intentionally arranged the material in these chapters as a chiasm. Okay, so the next kind of chiastic structure you should be aware of is one that comprises not just a story or a cycle, but an entire book. And a great example of that is the book of Ezekiel. It starts with the Lord coming to the defiled temple for investigative judgment and then departing in chapters 1 to 11. And it ends with the Lord coming to the restored temple and not departing in chapters 40 to 48. Then in chapters 12 to 23, we have oracles of judgment, which are parallel to the oracles of restoration in chapters 34 to 39. Then in chapter 24, we are informed that Jerusalem will be besieged while in chapter 33, we are informed that the city has fallen, which means that in the middle of the book are chapters 25 to 32, which are oracles against foreign nations. And at the very heart of those oracles, and therefore at the very center of the entire book, is the judgment on the fallen cherub in chapter 28, verses 11 to 19. So the structure of the book points to the judgment on the very one who is ultimately responsible for defilement and sin, and shows that this judgment is the prerequisite for true restoration, which is the topic of the second half of the book. So just like there are collections of stories in the Bible, there's also collections of books that belong together. And a good example of a collection like that that is structured as a chiasm is the five books of Moses, also known as the Pentateuch. Now, if you look at the first book, Genesis, and the last book, Deuteronomy, you might at first not see a lot of similarities, but once you look closer, you start to realize that they actually share some pretty significant themes. For example, they both have a strong focus on the land that God has prepared for his people, where they are to be fruitful and multiply, and where God wants to bless them. And it's probably not a coincidence that both books end with a section of poetry in which a major figure speaks prophetically about the future, followed by a record of that individual's death. In Genesis, that figure is Jacob, in Deuteronomy, it's Moses. Okay, so that's Genesis and Deuteronomy. Now, when we turn to Exodus, we see that in the first part of the book, Israel leaves Egypt and wanders in the wilderness, while in the second part, they're at Mount Sinai, where laws are given and there's a focus on the sanctuary, which is exactly what we also have in the book of Numbers, only in reverse order. In the first part of the book, Israel is at Mount Sinai, laws are given, and there's a focus on the sanctuary, and in the second part, they're wandering in the wilderness, preparing to enter the land of Canaan. So that means that the center of the first five books is the book of Leviticus, which is kind of interesting because for many Bible readers, this is probably the most challenging book. But according to the structure, this is the most important book. And one of the reasons for that is that this book basically describes how God will solve the sin problem that is so prevalent in the rest of the Pentateuch. So if we want to understand what the message of this first part of the Bible is, we really have to look at the book of Leviticus. And if you want to see another amazing chiastic structure that highlights this exact same thing, then go watch this video next, where I talk about first and second Kings and how the structure of those two books points to Jesus. Super fascinating stuff. So go check that out next and I'll see you there. Mm -hmm.